All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for tuning in here. And I'm going to just talk a little bit about, you know, soybean weed control and, and really talk about some of the lessons we can take from our failures in the East uh, as far as preserving some of the technologies that may be new uh, to growers in Western North Dakota. So I start with this slide and this picture in particular. Uh, so here's just a soybean field. That weed that you see over top of all the soybeans is horseweed. Uh, getting more and more familiar with that in Western North Dakota. And here's what happens if you try to use just Roundup multiple times a year and Roundup ready soybeans for horseweed control. So it's kind of showing we'll have some tools and I'll talk about those, but we can abuse them and get some widespread weed control failures. So here's kind of the outline of the topics I wanted to cover today, knowing there's probably a range of people uh, that are tuning in and wanting everyone just to be aware of uh, some, some different issues with soybeans. But basically I wanna give an overview of what we can do in soybeans for weed management. And then knowing that some people may already be growing soybeans in the West that are logged on to this webinar, I'll talk about some of our problematic weeds and some options we have for control of those weeds in soybean. So first to start with some generalizations. Uh, for those who may be thinking about soybeans or are new to soybean, if we think about our, our more typical Western North Dakota crops like pulse crops and sunflowers, if we look at those crops compared to soybeans when it comes to our herbicide options, we, we have a lot more post-emergence options that we can use in soybean than our pulse crops and sunflowers. You can kind of think of this as we have some generally stronger herbicides as well, even from the pre-emergence standpoint. And I'll show you some, some pages from the weed control guide that just shows we have, we have more options as a for a broadleaf crop for herbicides than what we we currently typically grow in western North Dakota. I briefly caught Greg Indris earlier and he kind of showed the the chart that we developed recently but the other thing with soybean is we have a number of options that we can use uh, when it comes just to focusing on weed control and soybean. We have our conventional or our, our non-GMO and then we have Roundup Ready, Liberty Link, go down the list here a number of options currently available today. Uh, many of these we have cultivars or varieties adapted to North Dakota, just maybe not Western North Dakota at this time. Something else I kind of want to point out when it comes to soybean weed control is we have plenty of options, but compared to some of our other crops like wheat, sunflower, canola, we tend to have a slower canopy closure in soybean than those other crops. So from a weed control perspective, that generally means we, we almost always need two herbicide passes in soybean to achieve uh, complete weed control, just because it, it's gonna take them a little bit longer to canopy, so that's more time for the sunlight to hit the, the soil between the rows and give weeds a chance to germinate and compete with soybeans. The, the last thing I want to point out when it comes to chemicals and soybeans is we tend to have a shorter rotation restrictions uh, from herbicides applied previous year or for burn down and no-till situations uh, than some of our other crops, particularly our pulse crops. So a, a page six here from the weed control guide, I pulled it out. This is our plant back interval for herbicides uh, to our different crops. And so I'll just point out, you know, we have soybean here towards the right side of the screen. If you go down, that's the months or days that we apply, that we have to wait after applying a herbicide to planting. And just to show this shorter interval, I'm going to point out here euphoria. And if you go across with euphoria, most crops are half a month to four to 12 months after applying euphoria to planting, uh, soybean is one to two days. Probably the most obvious contrast of soybean compared to other crops. But, you know, just again highlighting we can use more herbicides and also plant soybeans sooner after herbicide application in many cases compared to our other broadleaf crops. So this is the, uh, the PDF version here of, of the document that Greg kind of highlighted earlier. Uh, we have plenty of these available in online PS 1945, just a compilation of all the different herbicide resistant traits. And here's that chart that he showed as, as it exists in, in the document itself uh, that you can order or, or download online. And just basically going down the line, the, the different types of herbicide resistance packages that we have available in 2020 for soybean weed management. 
And then across the top is the different herbicides that we can use. So you can see, except for conventional or straight Liberty Link, we can use glyphosate in almost any uh, of our soybean varieties on the, on the market today. Uh, some of the newer ones, I'll uh, point out since this news came out yesterday, this LLGT27, there are some group 27 uh, herbicides or HPPD inhibitors that can be used with this trait. One got the federal registration yesterday, but at this time we, we do not anticipate having that herbicide available in North Dakota. So for practical purposes for this one, glyphosate and glufosinate would be what we can use post-emergence. So it's a quick chart because it may be confusing, especially if you're new to soybean, about what is currently on the market and then what is coming uh, to the market in the near future as well. So a few things I wanted to pull out to, to try and just address some of the strengths and weaknesses of some of these different uh, varieties when it comes to weed control. And so this is not a, this is not a comprehensive list. Um, it, it's really just trying, trying to get some general overviews of the different types of varieties we can plant and some of the things we, that we can accomplish with them. So starting with our conventional or the non-GMO soybeans, uh, really compared to the other soybean traits, weed control doesn't have a lot of strengths. The strengths here are the seed is cheaper and many varieties we can bin run. So both of those very important for Western North Dakota, cheaper seed is always a good thing and being able to save the seed and plant it again the next year, always a positive, uh, always a positive anywhere, but especially out West. So going down next to Roundup Ready, and here I'm really talking about, you know, Roundup Ready, glyphosate tolerant, um, the ability to just use glyphosate in crop. So of course the strength here is we glyphosate, despite the fact that we talk a lot about glyphosate resistance these days, it still controls most of our weeds out there. Uh, I have it listed here as application flexibility. So, you know, a pretty wide window of application, even in soybean, and a wide window of application parameters. Glyphosate can look good in, in a five gallon per acre carrier volume. It looks good in 15 gallons per acre. So it's really our most forgiving herbicide we've ever had as far as being able to achieve good weed control across a wide range of application uh, parameters. Now, one thing, the sub bullet point I wanna point out is that we do have the ability for NDSU developed glyphosate tolerant varieties to save the seed. So I know there's one developed uh, particularly uh, for Western North Dakota. I do not remember the, um, the variety number off the top of my head, but Ted Helms' program has developed a glyphosate tolerant variety where we can save the seed. So that's kind of another good thing for out west. It'll be a little bit cheaper and can save that seed to plant in future years. If you do have a variety that is Roundup ready and it says Roundup ready on the bag that is patented and we can't save the seed. So it's these glyphosate tolerant NDSU varieties that we can use that. Now, when we talk about glyphosate and crop, the, the glaring weakness is glyphosate resistant weeds uh, becoming more and more of a problem, especially in the, in the soybean growing areas. But of course, I don't have to preach out west about glyphosate resistant kochia or horseweed too much. So that's a, that's a glaring weakness with Roundup Ready or glyphosate tolerant is those resistant weeds. Liberty Link, we've had on the market for a little over a decade now, as far as soybeans are concerned. A program many might be used to uh, due to Liberty Link canola, but we can also use it in soybeans. So as far as strengths in this program, broadleaf weeds, and as I think out west, especially horseweed or mare's tail in the no-till areas, uh, Liberty is, is one of the best herbicides that we have for horseweed or mare's tail. Weaknesses of Liberty and the Liberty Link system, grasses are the glaring weakness. So you'll want to include one of our group one herbicides like Assure 2 or Select Max to take out our grasses. And the other thing with Liberty, um, especially as, as we go out west and we tend to reduce our carrier volume in applications, we do need plenty of water. Uh, 15 gallons per acre is the minimum carrier volume that we want to see with Liberty uh, in order to make it work better being a contact herbicide. The other things with Liberty are we need good sunshine, good heat, and the more humid it is, the better. So it works pretty well in East North Dakota if we get into our very dry stretches out west and don't have that humidity, may not expect the same level of control 
as far as the sunshine and the heat, you know, a, a good reference point I like to use is, is think about when you spray Liberty, spray during banking hours, nine to five, a nice sunny day that's hot and you'll anticipate better control. Going to our other traits are Roundup Ready Extend. So this has glyphosate and dicamba resistance uh, in the soybeans. So strengths, broadleaf weeds. Um, if I think about Western North Dakota weeds that we have some strengths on, kochia, and then horseweed again. So the glyphosate key for, for horseweed and also for non-glyphosate resistant kochia. But then dicamba would be one of the better soybean herbicides we have for control of either of those two weeds as long as we don't have resistance. And I, and I should say the dicamba rates in extend soybean are a half a pound of dicamba per acre. So much higher uh, than we currently use in the crops that we do use dicamba in. Uh, weaknesses of, of this system, you have the, if you le read the approved labels that we can use, the approved dicamba product labels, we do have very strict application parameters. Uh, so that, that can be tricky to kind of legally make an application. And if, you, if you're relying on the dicamba alone, then grasses can be an issue. Um, further south, especially in areas of the country that deal uh, with a lot more barnyard grass, which is becoming more common in the west, uh, we, we're seeing issues with the tank mix of glyphosate and dicamba on controlling barnyard grass. So that's one of the potential issues, but, uh, but we still do have glyphosate and group one herbicides to help overcome some of the grass issues. And list D3 is kind of the newer uh, one on the market. I don't know if there's any good varieties for Western North Dakota yet, but you know, this is uh, the first three-way stack to hit the market that allows both glyphosate, Liberty, and then one of our growth regulators, in this case, 2,4-D. So we have a number of options post-emergence, not really locked into any of those. Um, we'll have another option in the extend system, hopefully in 2021, that allows glyphosate, Liberty, and dicamba. Uh, but for now in 2020, we're, we're looking at the E3. So the Liberty component can be pretty good on kosher. Both the Liberty and 2,4-D component are very good for horseweed control. The weaknesses here, especially um, knowing you may not want to use a lot of water for Liberty, the 2,4-D component, it, it doesn't change the fact that 2,4-D is weak on kosher. So if you try to control kosher in the E3 system, uh, Liberty would be the one that's bearing the brunt of the work there to try and control kosher. And the last one that, that's newer on the market, the LLGT27, here we have that flexibility for glyphosate or Liberty post-emergence. But again, we, we can't use that 27 component in North Dakota, at least in 2020. So it's really just another variety that allows flexibility of glyphosate or Liberty or the tank mix if you wish to go that route as well. So that's kind of the, an overview of some of the strengths and weaknesses of the different soybean weed control systems we have out there. I'm guessing in West North Dakota will mainly be either conventional uh, the NDSU glyphosate tolerant, or some people may go with the extend to try and go after kosher. So that would be my, what I'm guessing will be the, the popular varieties in West North Dakota for weed control. As far as showing some of the different options for soybean weed control, here's just the cover of the 2020 guide. Uh, pages 32 to 41 cover soybean herbicides and programs in, in the 2020 edition of the weed control guide. So hopefully everyone has a copy. If not, I know we still have plenty of physical copies available and it is available online. So a couple of things I just wanted to point out. Uh, page 32 is our pre-emergence or soil applied herbicide page. If you go down the list, if you're, if you're used to growing sunflowers or pulse crops, you'll see many of these herbicides are, are familiar. So there is a lot of overlap with these soil applied herbicides that we can use in soybean that we currently use for our, our other broadleaf crops just more of a, a wider variety that is available and we di have different tank mixes available uh, just for soybean control. Uh, for instance, here in the right column, we, we have a number of different authority pre-mixes and some of these are targeted just for, soy for, the, uh, for the soybean market. So a number of, of different products, it opens up the, uh, the product availability compared to our pulse crops once we get into some of these tank mixes. On the left side of my screen, is just a soil applied herbicide again. So that's just that page 32. The right side, page 33, here's our post applied herbicides 
that we can use in soybean. And again, there, there's going to be some overlap with some of our crops. So if you grow peas, certainly Raptor and Varisto, uh, familiar with those products. But here's where we get into our, our uh, group 14 herbicides. So here's a number of the herbicides we can use uh, post-emergence. So group 14, Spartan falls into that. So this is a post-emergence option we can use in soybean. So currently we have uh, Cadet, Cobra, Resource, Blazer, and then Flexstar, but I'll point out some issues with Flexstar in the West later. Uh, first rate would be a, a group two herbicide, another new one that we can use in soybean compared to other crops. So more flexibility and post-emergence herbicides. Everything on page 33 can be, be used in any traded soybean, including the conventional non-GMO soybeans. And then we have a few pages dedicated to our herbicide resistant traits. Uh, so just the different products that can be used in our different systems. And then some notes, as, as I mentioned, we have some very strict parameters with the extend soybean and we cover those in detail on its own page, uh, page 36 this year. The other thing I wanna point out, so as far as learning lessons from the East, so hopefully you just kind of got the point across there, more post-emergence options, that does not mean we should be skipping a pre. You know, we know very well, do not skip a pre-emergence herbicide in our crops that we don't have a post option. Uh, we have had many that skip that pre in soybean and that's where we've really gotten ourselves into trouble as far as herbicide resistance. However, the other reason to not skip that pre is we, we can see some yield loss happen very quickly in North Dakota uh, that the Midwest, other areas that receive more rain do not tend to see. So here's some data of, uh, led and compiled by Greg Enders at Carrington about when we remove our weeds and how that affects soybean yield. So if we have weed free throughout the season, he's basically shown we can get 44 bushels across these eight site years was the, was the average when we were weed free throughout the year. If we had weeds, but waited until cod lead into that first trifoliate to control those weeds, we would lose a couple bushels due to early season competition. As we go down the chart, you see the longer we wait, the more bushels we lose. And when we don't control weeds, uh, we end up with about half the yield over these eight research site years. So you may hear with, with soybean weed control from other areas of the country that they don't anticipate much in the way of yield loss. If you wait until V1 to V2 to control your weeds, those areas of the country tend to receive about an inch of rain a week in July and August. Uh, which will help soybeans recover greatly. Our more arid climate, it, it's a much bigger risk to not control those weeds early. So as far as just protecting our, our maximum soybean yield, that's why we don't want to skip that pre and, and make sure we control our weeds season long. The other thing I want to point out, not just, just losing yield due to soybean yield loss, but the other big important issue or lesson to learn from the yeast. So here's some data that was compiled um, that back in 2015 in the I states before the Extend soybean program came on the market, looking at Extend plus glyphosate on glyphosate resistant Palmer amaranth. So this was probably about a hundred or so different types of programs lumped into three types of generalized soybean programs. And this is just looking at Palmer amaranth weed control, not looking at soybean yield. But essentially with, with a very aggressive weed, if we have two passes of a herbicide, uh, a pre followed by one post, uh, in this case, in this year, we had about 80% control. Three pass program, pre-emergence followed by two applications of glyphosate plus dicamba, pretty darn close to 100%. Now this, this two pass program, that's just glyphosate plus dicamba uh, twice in the growing season, no pre-emergence herbicide. Now, some people might be thinking that looks like about 90, maybe 95% control. Might be a, a pretty alluring program, a little bit cheaper, a little bit easier to manage by skipping that pre. But this is the ultimate lesson I wanna, I wanna pass down of, of a failure from the East, is we are working with a glyphosate resistant weed with just one effective mode of action post, in this case, dicamba. So it may look good initially, but if we keep using these programs, we've been down this road before with glyphosate resistance. And here's just kind of a, a, a pretty 
now we can call it humorous. But this was some actual literature uh, back in the late 90s about some stewardship programs for Roundup Ready soybean, no reason for residuals in Roundup Ready soybean. Um, you know, back in the mid 90s, when 1996, the Roundup Ready soybean was launched. The data to that point, it's difficult to see in this slide, but basically, uh, one or two applications of Roundup looked as good or better than some of our more um, typical soybean herbicide programs at the time. But a lot of people shifted to just that two pass Roundup program. That's kind of what led to a lot of the resistance issues. And now we've gone backwards to using residuals. Uh, because we abuse these products. So lesson there, you know, some of you may be able to now use glyphosate for the first time in crop if you go with a glyphosate tolerant soybean and it'll look pretty good for a while, but we can easily break that system. And we do have the weeds already out there in Western North Dakota with Koshin horseweed that will be challenged by just glyphosate alone. All right, going to switch gears here and talk about a, a few of the weeds <laughs> that will be problematic now and into the future and how soybean can fit into their management program. So first up, we'll talk about horseweed. And with a specific focus on 2020, why I really wanna talk about horseweed, um, this is just a, a picture showing that it was our wettest year on record last year. If, here's a picture of September rainfall statewide, uh, more rainfall than normal in September in the west even more so than in the east. The reason I picked out September is because horseweed will generally germinate in the fall. And as long as we have some rainfall in about September, we will get some good horseweed germination. So we had the conditions to have horseweed germinate in the fall. And here's just a chart basically showing the horseweed life cycle. The black bar is what we call our fall emerging, emerging horseweed. This is typically what we have in North Dakota. So it starts here August and September, get that rainfall, we have the germination, and so now as we're getting into uh, April here, and snow is gone, we're getting some heat, horseweed is going to warm up and start bolting here within the next month or so. And so we're going to have to deal with these populations that overwintered after they germinated in the fall. Other states deal with a lot of spring emerging horseweed. Uh, we do have some in North Dakota, we're just not sure how prevalent it is yet seems we have a lot more fall emerging. So in a, in a case like going into 2020, wet fall, we probably didn't get a fall burn down on, and now we have a lot of horseweed uh, getting ready to, to bolt and start becoming a problem for us. Just a couple pictures of horseweed. Here's one of the biggest challenges in the bottom right corner for the fall emerging horseweed. Uh, this is a picture taken in about late April. Um, and a state a little bit further south of here, so maybe equivalent of early May for, for weed sizes. But those plants that survive the fall, we have a, a range of heights when we go into a field for a burn down. So this one in the middle might be eight to 10 inches, and we have a range of maybe two to up to that 10 inches. So we have, we have a, a wide variety of sizes, and they survived the winter, so they're, they're a little bit more hardy and difficult to deal with if we wait until spring to control horseweed. So let's package everything together for what we can use for horseweed control and soybean. A lot of these principles are the same for, for the, our other crops. Um, you know, burn down is better in the fall, a bit tougher in the spring, uh, but soybean, we do have more options. So we can use metribuzin. The, the golden standard would be something like gramoxone, uh, metribuzin, and then 2,4-D. Uh, the sharpened products, again, alone, they're, those products are very good on horseweed in a burndown situation. <clears throat> Knowing we have glyphosate resistance, and as we're cold in the spring, 2,4-D can be relatively weak if it's applied alone. We can use dicamba. In this case, uh, being out west, basically dicamba will be our product uh, that we can use ahead of our extend soybeans. Um, otherwise, the waiting period is a little bit longer in the west to plant soybeans that aren't uh, dicamba tolerant. And then Elevore, which we've had for a couple of years now, we can use it in other products like sunflower. Uh, we can also use it in soybeans 14 days before planting. These are better on horseweed than 2,4-D alone. So here's kind of the, the options we can use, uh, very generalized for horseweed control, burn down ahead of soybeans. Uh, as far as our pre-choice, Metribuzin, 
Valor or Authority products. All of them can, can be pretty good on horseweed. Now, we do have more options in soybean than other crops, but we do have glyphosate resistance and then group two or ALS resistance, mainly first rate. So first rate resistant horseweed. So in that case, we're still better off growing something like corn or wheat. But if we do have soybeans, if we have multiple resistance, then that puts us into Liberty, Dicamba, or the Enlist crops. So straight glyphosate tolerant crops or the conventional with horseweed, we won't anticipate good control uh, because of resistance. A uh, quick slide here on narrowly hawksbeard. Uh, stole these, this slide and the next one from Brian Jenks, but basically the, uh, the programs that we know that work on hawksbeard. Uh, so in this case, uh, in, the, in the fall, number of options, all these very flexible to go back to soybean. In the spring, you know, both glyphosate and sharpen, we can go into soybean, higher rates of glyphosate, and then even uh, later, uh, if we have glyphosate tolerant soybeans, we can use glyphosate and crop. All right, quickly, a uh, couple of notes here on kosher. As far as new products for soybean, we don't have much. But if you're new to soybean, then we'll have some new products for you for kosher control. Uh, the one thing I want to point out here is, is we, we know we're getting more populations of glyphosate-resistant kosher. Uh, so even though we do have that, op, uh, that option in crop, if we do have resistance, um, we, we won't be able to control kosher with glyphosate alone. And soybean, no big surprise there. As far as our products that are rated highest for kosher control in soybean, uh, here's basically the list. So pre-emergence, many of the current products that we'll use in pulse crops or sunflower, uh, so Authority or Spartan, Syncor, uh, Valor, or the Zidua products. Post-emergence in soybean were actually somewhat limited, especially compared to, to wheat or corn. Uh, so, this is showing just uh, assuming we have glyphosate resistant kosher and glyphosate is out the window, that would leave us with three effective options post emergence. And that would be uh, Flexstar, Liberty, and Liberty Link soybean or the Dicamba products. Uh, one of the issues with Flexstar out west is not all counties in West North Dakota can use Flexstar. And those that can use Flexstar in the west, it's a nine month interval to small grains. And then otherwise, it's 12 to 18 month rotation restriction to all other crops. So if you do adopt soybeans and use Flexstar in the West, that, that basically locks you into small grains the following year based on rotation restrictions. So a quick note there about Flexstar. Another quick note about dicamba, we, we do have a couple of dicamba resistant populations of kosher. This population I'm showing here, some pictures from the Devil's Lake area, probably not resistant, but this is one of our failings in the East a lot of times in, in soybeans, starting with the glyphosate resistant era and continues today for some people. These kosher plants were about 12 inches tall at application. Even though we have some, you know, some, we'll put it in quotes, more powerful or stronger herbicides, uh, we still need to apply these to weeds when they're smaller in order to control uh, those weeds. And here's just showing about a month after that application, most of that kosher is still alive and did go on to produce seed. So some, some expanded options compared to our other crops, uh, but in this case, we, we still need to be respective of the weed size when we do apply. All right, I should be wrapping up here. So I just want to make a quick note about these two pigweeds. Um, been out west a number of times this winter and last winter. A lot of times asked to talk about palmer or water hemp. I want to give the current update of both and then leave you with, with some control options in soybean um, and if and when they do become established. So the Palmer update, this, this could be a real situation in the West uh, in 2020. 2019, these counties in gold, we found Palmer in millet fields. I doubt these were the only counties that had millet with Palmer in it. This is just where we found it. So if you did have millet in 2019, there might be a decent chance that there is some Palmer in there that may have gone to seed. The good news compared to pulse crops or, or sunflowers, we have a lot more options in soybean uh, for palmer amaranth control. Here's just a map of our water hemp populations across North Dakota uh, and, and basically every county in the eastern half of the state, but we are seeing populations creep west. 
So very problematic weed in, in the eastern part of the state. It is creeping west. Uh, just another one, when, it, when we talk about Palmer and water hemp for our pigweed control, those two are basically our current pigweeds that we know and deal with on steroids. So I just want to show this slide because if, if you look at this slide about effective um, herbicides that we have, and this is for Palmer and water hemp with the resistance that they're, they're probably going to come in with, we have plenty of options in soybean. Certainly a lot more options uh, than, than our other broadleaf crops grown out west. So a number of different pre-emergence options, and then currently uh, uh, four different post-emergence options that we can deal with. So with that, I think I'll just go ahead and end it there, getting through some of our potential options for 2020 for our problematic weeds, because um, it looks like I'm, I'm about out of time here. So that, that's basically uh, what I had to cover today. Just really wanted to, to cover some of the basics for those who may be thinking about soybean and then show some of the current options that we have today in 2020 uh, for some of our problematic weeds.